Hi everyone, I'm Hannah Harvey, and today I'm really excited to talk to you about a country that, although I've never been there, becomes nearer to my heart all the time, and this is Lebanon. First I'll give a little overview about the country and the people that live there to give you some context, and then we'll dive into the importance of traditional Lebanese food in relation to national and cultural identity. We'll go over signature Lebanese dishes and traditional ingredients, how certain foods are prepared, and even how some plates are presented. And then I'll discuss the health impacts um, of the creeping Western diet on Lebanese people, both living in Lebanon and in the U.S., and some health benefits and practices that Lebanese people live by. So Lebanon is a tiny country in the Middle East of Asia, about a third of the size of Maryland. It's on the Mediterranean Sea, sandwiched between Israel and Syria. People primarily speak Arabic, but other common languages are French, English, and Armenian. The majority of Lebanese people are Arabs, though a small percentage are Armenian or some other ethnicity. The larger religious groups in Lebanon are Muslims, who make up about 54%, 27% being Sunni and 27% being Shia, and Christians, who make up about 40%, with the smallest group being Druze. The most populated regions are the capital city of Beirut and on the Mediterranean coast. Lebanon has forests, mountains, valleys, plains, and beaches, and the climate is pretty mild. Winters are wet and snowy, and summers are hot and dry. From the photos I've seen, it looks really beautiful there, and I really hope I'll be able to visit someday. But um, unfortunately, right now, the region is pretty unstable, what with the Syrian war still ongoing. My sister-in-law, her name is Alam, which actually means, and pronounced in Arabic, is actually Ahlam, um, which actually means dreams in Arabic. Um, she's a second-generation Lebanese-American. Both of her parents immigrated to the States from Lebanon in the 80s. Um, her mom was actually a teenager at the time, and they became citizens. But they still have lots of family living in the Middle East. Alam has told me about how some of her relatives, um, like her great aunt and her cousins, had to leave their home in Yarmouk, Syria, months ago due to the war there. And she actually sent me a video showing the village of apartment buildings where her relatives used to live and the streets where Alam used to play and eat watermelons. And in the video, it's really hard to imagine what she describes from her memory because it's now just a deserted ghost town, just all rubble and dust. So with the refugee crisis still looming large, uh, border restrictions in Lebanon are becoming tighter and tensions are higher. And this instability has brought down the economy and greater instances of food insecurity, health problems, and displacement have resulted. So, um, But even in, in times of displacement, where being in a foreign country can make a person feel lonely or nostalgic for home, it's really food that can preserve memory and tradition. Um, one of the best home cooks I know is Alam's mother, Gada. I've known, I've gotten to know Gada very well. She's seriously one of the sweetest and most easygoing people I know. Alam has said that her mom is probably like that, be, in part because she experienced the civil war in Lebanon. Um, this civil war went on from 1975 to 1990, so, um, and although life here in America is not without its challenges for her, it's definitely been breezier than living in a war-torn country, so. Last summer, I, I really got to know Gada very well because I helped her prepare and sell Lebanese food at the farmer's market in Salem, Massachusetts. Um, where we were both living at the time. Alam cleverly named her mom Lady Gada. Um, I thought that was really, really cute. Um, so Chef Gada and I spent many, many hours together in the kitchen. We were chopping peppers, onions, garlic, and fresh parsley, squeezing lemons, grinding chickpeas, roasting eggplants, mixing tahini, and making sweets. And we sold traditional Lebanese hummus, tabbouleh, kibbe, baba ganoush, baklava, namuda, and chickpea salad. Um, chickpea salad's actually one of my favorite summer salads, and uh, I've posted a very vague recipe um, in the comments below. That is the other thing. Gada doesn't ever follow recipes. 
She doesn't use measuring spoons or measuring cups. She just truly cooks from her own intuition, from the heart, from what she knows tastes right, and from what I've read and from what I've experienced personally with Gata, that really is the Lebanese way. The Lebanese take pride in their traditional foods. There have been major disputes between Lebanese and Israeli cooks over who makes the best hummus. Um, this is called the hummus wars. Israeli and Lebanese cooks actually went back and forth, seeing who could make the biggest plate of hummus. And finally, 300 Lebanese chefs came together and uh, with the aim of taking a stand against big Israeli food industry giants um, in order to defend the Lebanese heritage and country. And together they worked to break the Guinness World Record for the largest hummus plate, ultimately weighing 10 tons. So yeah, I'd say that for many Lebanese people, their identity and pride is really tied into their food. And in case you're interested in reading more about that story, here's a link to the full article. So Gada and I would make lots and lots of hummus. She pronounces it hummus, which is probably the most iconic dish of Lebanon. When Gada and I made it, it always came out best when we used chickpeas that were soaked overnight, not from a can, and then cooked in water until soft and velvety. We'd pop the chickpeas in the food processor in batches with tahini, which is basically sesame seeds in peanut butter form. It's very nutritious, it's delicious on lots of different things. Plus we'd add olive oil, garlic, salt, cumin, and fresh lemon juice, but sometimes she'd use uh, limes if they were on sale that week. Um, just really any citrus that we could we could find and when we packaged the hummus up We'd always spoon in a swirl design and then top it with olive oil and sprinkle it with paprika It was beautiful to look at and it was such a simple combination of ingredients, but the flavors were so perfect We would sell out of hummus almost every week at the farmers market and some people would even put in orders For the hummus a week ahead of time to make sure they didn't miss out um in my opinion, Gata's fresh homemade hummus far exceeds any mass-produced hummus you can find in the grocery store. The flavor is just uh, unparalleled. Something else we would often sell out of was kibbe. It spelled like it, it looks like kibbe, but Gata pronounces it kippy. Um, kippy is ground meat, usually beef, lamb, or goat mixed together with minced onions and uh, burgle which we call in English bulgur or cracked wheat. Um, this mixture is then formed into balls and gatas were always shaped kind of like footballs and then they can be baked, fried, cooked, or even served raw. Raw kippi is called kippi naye, which, and I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing that wrong, but <laughs> um, it's rumored to be delicious, but because I'm a vegetarian, I haven't actually tried it. The thing about Kibbe naye, though, is because it's raw ground meat, there really needs to be a serious precaution taken when making it to avoid contamination. So in Lebanon, people are sure to either grind their meat at home with their own clean blades or they go to a trusted butcher. In poorer areas, it's not uncommon for people, especially little kids and the elderly, to become sick from consuming raw meat because of poor food preparation. So Bagata and I would always bake our kibbe because, um, you know, there were, of course, regulations since we were selling our food at a public market. You know, we, we couldn't risk serving raw meat on a hot summer day. But um, perfect for a hot summer day is a fresh green salad called tabbouli. Gata taught me to make this by finely chopping onion, garlic, tomatoes, and tons of fresh parsley. I mean, I would chop parsley until my arms were sore. <laughs> um... All of that was mixed with olive oil, salt, pepper, fresh lemon or lime juice, and burgal or cracked wheat. It's such a refreshing dish, and you can have it with pita or rice, uh, crackers, it's so good. We'd also make uh, baba ganoush. This is made with, um, we'd, we'd cut eggplants in half, drizzle them with olive oil, salt and pepper, and bake them at 350 to 400 until they were nice and roasted and soft. And then we'd scoop out the flesh and mash it up, mixing in tahini and citrus with a little more salt and pepper to taste. And again, for presentation, we'd sprinkle a little paprika on the top. Um, for a sweet option at the market, we'd either make baklava or namura. Lebanese baklava is 
different from Greek baklava because instead of using honey like the Greeks do, Lebanese cooks will use simple syrup and orange blossom water or rose water. And this, this is pretty typical with Lebanese desserts, and it's incredibly flavorful and delicious. I have a major sweet tooth, so I love baklava and namura, and these are actually the only Lebanese desserts I've tried so far and have actually helped to make. Um, but I am completely open to trying others. Uh, Namura is really tasty, so if you get a chance to try it or make it yourself, I say go for it. It's made from semolina and has the texture somewhere between cake and cornbread. It's soaked in simple syrup, so it's really sweet, but it's wonderful with coffee, which is a typical tradition in Lebanon. Gada has actually told me she has a hard time eating sweets if they don't come with a cup of coffee. It's also common in Lebanon to pretty much always have meza on the table. Meza is a platter of small plates, kind of like Spanish tapas. Um, Lebanese meza might include dishes like hummus with pita, tabbouli, baba ganoush, olives, meat and vegetable kebabs, and grape leaves stuffed with rice and splashed with lemon juice. Um, meza is commonly eaten throughout the day and it's offered to guests who visit. I can remember when my brother Seth started dating Alam, he would tell us about the times he would visit with Gada, and no matter um, what time of day or night it was, she would start cooking up a storm for him. It was really her way of welcoming him into her home and into the family. Seriously, in Lebanon, a meal shared is a bond, and you can taste the love in the food. This hasn't changed for Gada since she immigrated to the U.S., and certainly she does like other foods that she's found in America, but the core of her diet is her traditional dishes that she makes at home with her fresh ingredients. Um, Alam and her younger brother Ali were born in the U.S. and grew up in American schools, but they embraced and maintained their Lebanese roots at home. Alam, who is 29 uh, years old, she seems to crave traditional Lebanese foods a bit more than Ali, who is 16, and right now he just likes the cheap and convenient foods that most American teens like, that his peers like, um, like pizza and mac and cheese, that kind of thing. Um, Western eating habits and the availability of junk foods are becoming much more common in Lebanon, and the country is seeing increases in overweight and obesity, similar to what's happening in other parts of the world right now. Between 1997 and 2009, actually, the prevalence of obesity in Lebanon went up to 62%, and that's an incredible increase in a matter of 12 years. Right now, current estimates say that 32% of adults in Lebanon are obese and 36% are overweight. Fats are more common in the diet now, consisting of about 39% of all energy consumed. Fried foods like falafel are very popular. Um, people are also just eating more fast foods and junk foods and it's reported that people are eating more meats sugars or sweeteners and salt and unfortunately they're eating fewer fruits vegetables fish and whole grains they're also reportedly drinking less water and unfortunately this newer poorer diet is really leading to similar diet related illnesses that we're seeing here in the u.s like diabetes cardiovascular disease osteoporosis dyslipidemia, iron deficiency anemia is common, and other nutrient deficiencies as well. But just like the U.S. has dietary recommendations from USDA's MyPlate to help promote healthier eating habits, Lebanon has what's called the Cedar Food Guide. And instead of being grouped into a pyramid, the foods are grouped into a, the silhouette of a cedar tree, which is the emblem on the Lebanese flag. So again, there is this strong connection between the Lebanese national identity and food. But this is just one way that the people of Lebanon are trying to improve public health with this new Western diet on the rise. Some traditional Lebanese at-home healing practices include drinking teas and herb mixtures to prevent the common cold and eating foods like honey, molasses, garlic, onions, asparagus, artichokes, and black seed to promote health and prevent disease. And then spices like turmeric and uh, uh, excuse me, turmeric and cinnamon are also used for health benefits. Some people also use multivitamins and supplements. Um, and from the pers perspective of a nutrition professional, I think the traditional Lebanese diet is a really healthy one. Certainly, there are many dishes that are fried, and the desserts are very sugary. But it's also the way they eat these foods slowly and throughout the day, you know, traditionally anyway, that makes it pretty balanced. The traditional diet really includes 
lean meats and fish that come from local pastures and the Mediterranean Sea, fresh fruits and vegetables like citrus fruits and melons, potatoes, grapes, apples, and olives. They're all harvested from the area. And there's also a traditional strained yogurt that, that's used in a lot of different dishes that's made from goat's milk called lebne. And, um, you know, the goats, they graze in the mountains and in the Becca Valley, and their milk is turned to yogurt over the course of many weeks in these traditional earthenware jugs. So the traditional Lebanese diet is balanced and, in my opinion, very nutritious. These traditional food practices have obviously sustained the people of Lebanon for a long, long time. But it's the Western fast foods and eating habits that are spreading throughout the globe that worry me. And as a person who might counsel someone in the future who might come from Lebanon or another country in that region, it's hard to know what to expect because eating habits may be a little bit of a mix of Western and traditional Middle Eastern diets. I'd really want to ask my clients about the specific foods that they're eating most of the time, keeping in mind that their food practices might vary um, and be very tightly bound to their identities. And I'd really want to get to know my clients as individuals. Just because, you know, I know one Lebanese family doesn't mean I understand every perspective, what people have been through, and what they believe. I'd want to get to know them so that I could understand their view of the world and themselves better. You know, if they're coming to me for help, I'd want to do my best to support them in achieving their goals and um, with their background in mind. Um, so anyway, I'm really appreciative, um, of being able to present this to you, um, because it's something that's close to my heart, and so I appreciate you listening. I hope it's been as valuable for you as it has been for me. Thank you very much.